Hello everyone and welcome back to The Beatles Forever. I did a video a few months back about George Harrison and his dream home. So now it's time to find out about Paul McCartney and his house on Cavendish Avenue. Paul's, Paul decided to live in London while the rest of the Beatles were out in the country or suburbs. <laughs> Paul bought the house April 13, 1965. The three-story Regency townhouse was purchased from a physician named Desmond O'Neill for 40,000 pounds. It was a short walk to the EMI Studios on Abbey Road, and it often functioned as a base for the group for meetings before or after they were recording. Paul decided to get a place of his own. Paul used to live at his girlfriend Jane Asher's house with her family in the guest room. Well, after three years, he decided he should find a place of his own. According to Paul McCartney Project, the house was a square white Georgian house protected from the street by high brick walls and electric gates. The old house had three baths, two guest bedrooms, and separate quarters for the couple who came to take care of Paul and Jane's needs. Instead of turning the decoration over to professionals, they decided to furnish it themselves. Paul and Jane decorate the house. They took pleasure in shopping for each piece individually, sometimes buying used furniture at secondhand shops and refinishing it themselves. Paul was proud to point out that the Victorian clock and the mantel cost only seven pounds, and the sofa and armchairs, which he had upholstered in a little in a bottle green velvet, cost only twenty pounds together. Of course, there was also a gleaming bronze Pelosi sculpture called Solo, worth many, many thousands of pounds, and an 1851 clock and a collection of Tiffany glass that were priceless. The floors were covered in deep pile carpets in sedate tones of brown and gray, and Paul's bedroom, which faced the front courtyard, had a king-sized bed covered in port halt linens, which were changed almost daily by his loyal housekeeper, Rose. Paul also had a closet built that ran the width of the 22-foot room, which he stocked with the latest fashions from King's Road and the top tailors. In the master bath, it was completely tiled in imported blue and white mosaics, and he built a sunken tub big enough for two. And that was according to Peter Brown, The Love You Make, 2002. And according to MansionGlobal.com, the house spans 5,360 square feet across three stories, but it could be substantially expanded by another 2,000 to 3,000 square feet, says Mark Schneiderman, director Arlington Residential. At least two neighboring homes have been substantially extended by creating basements, incorporating a swimming pool, gym, cinema room, and additional guest accommodations. Other owners in the street have built detached studios or summer homes at the end of the garden, and many homes in the celebrity-favored neighborhood come with private gardens, and this house is no exception. The garden reaches 187 feet beyond the back of the house and backs onto gardens on all sides, creating an atmosphere of tranquility rarely found within such close proximity to central London. Mr. Snyderman said, It feels more like a country house than a London house. Some neat facts about the house, according to ShadyOldLady.com. The music room den was on the top floor and had a window overlooking the front courtyard. Songs such as Penny Lane, Getting Better, and Hey Jude were written there. A night piano stood in the music room, and McCartney got design team Binder, Edwards, and Vaughn to paint the piano psychedelic colors. The job cost 300 pounds. McCartney had a meditation chapel built in his garden around 1967, which contained a circular bed donated to him by Groucho Marx, of all people. In 1968, his fiancée, Jane Asher, returned unexpectedly to Cavendish Avenue from Bristol to find McCartney in bed with another girl, and so they broke up shortly afterwards. McCartney was the only Beatle to remain in London during the years that the Beatles were together, and the house is still owned by Paul. And then Medium.com had some interesting things in their article. Paul had lived with the Asher family for three years, and he wanted to buy a house for him and Jane, but he had very particular tastes. He didn't want to live in the suburbs, and he didn't want to do a lot of house hunting for the house. So in the Paul McCartney biography book by Philip Norman, uh, Paul had Brian Epstein's personal assistant help him, and he poured over estate agent catalogs for promising entries. And then Paul rejected a lot of the properties. He felt that they were showy or vulgar. He said, this is the sort of place where Gary Marsden of Gary and the Pacemakers would live. <laughs> In April 1965, Paul finally approved the purchase of a handsome townhome that suited his exacting requirements, 7 Cavendish Avenue. 
It was ideally situated close to Regent's Park and less than a ten-minute walk from Abbey Road. Paul was excited to renovate the house. He was handy and he liked painting and decorating. And he told the architects who were redoing the place that he wanted a kind of home where a smell of cabbage floated up from the basement. To him, that meant comfort and security. He wanted to spend only 5,000 pounds to renovate it, but it ended up costing him 20,000 pounds. His taste ranged from the combination of ultra-trendiness and ultra-tradition. That was how Paul was himself. Cavendish, as Paul liked to call it, was intended to be an anti-Graceland, elegant and quietly tasteful. Most observers and style gurus applauded his renovation, though one waspish visitor described it as a working-class posh. It was a high-tech place. Well, it was supposed to be high-tech, but sometimes the gadgets didn't work. According to Paul McCartney, the biography by Philip Norman, his bedroom curtains were supposed to open and close by remote control, but they seldom did, while his automated home cinema screen jammed so often it was quicker to unroll it by hand. His expensive stereo system continually broke down, and knobs always seemed to be falling off his professional Brunel tape decks. So one feature that greatly impressed his friends was one of the first domestic video recorders in the UK. Unfortunately, there were only three channels, and one of those, BBC Two, was less than a year old. And nobody in Britain, not even Paul McCartney, would have color television for another two years. According to Paul McCartney's biography uh, by Philip Norman, he got a color TV set and a prototype video recorder from the BBC as a gift. In those days, the gadgets were still a bit unreliable. Well, life as Beatles in 1965, uh, according to Medium.com, John hated suburban living but would spend long periods moping in his Weybridge mansion. Paul dashed around London in his mini, often without his bandmates. George had a new interest in Indian spiritualism and an old one in industrial scale womanizing. Ringo and Marine liked to entertain at home, and Starr even had his own pub style bar room with a dartboard. Okay, once the house was done, Paul gave elaborate lunches and dinners to show off his new home to his fellow Beatles, the manager Brian Epstein, George Martin, their producer and friend, and also friends and relations. In his home, it was ultra trendy and ultra tradition, just like Paul, and there were expensive finds from Kensington and Chelsea antique markets, mingled with domestic fixtures to be found in humbler homes throughout the north. In the dining room, there was an oversized clock which had once hung outside the Army and Navy store in Victoria. Outside on the garden terrace stood a human-sized white rabbit, Mad Hatter, and other characters from Alice in Wonderland. It was a housewarming gift from his brother Michael. Paul's house had no basement, so the statement Paul had made about smelling cabbage from the basement was kind of a strange one. <laughs> uh, Paul's music room was in the former servants' quarters on the top floor, it overlooked the front drive and the black security gate that was newly built in 1965. And to get the family feel he desired, he got four cats. They were named Thesby, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. It's mentioned in the biography book that the sacrilege of the names never reached the Beatles' American public, or Paul might have suffered the wrath that John did. He also got an old English sheepdog named Martha. It was a puppy. Paul said he always wanted a dog since childhood, but he was told that the house was too small when he was a kid, so they never got one. So while Jane was there, Jane Asher was his girlfriend, and she was an excellent cook as well as a gracious hostess. She accepted that it was her role to prepare meals and to care for the man of the house. And when Paul's Aunt Jen came to visit, it usually coincided with Wimbledon. So one time, Paul got her expensive tickets to watch with seats on the center of court, but she preferred to stay at home and watch the matches on his color TV, which... There weren't many in English homes at that time. Paul's dad was a frequent visitor, along with his wife, Angie, and newly adopted daughter, Ruth. And Jane taught Ruth how to cook, sew, and crochet. And Paul and Jane would take her to a toy shop, according to Ruth. So Paul knew what he wanted and where he wanted to live, and he didn't want to be away from the city. He was a bachelor at that time, and he wanted to be part of the city. He found a fixer-upper and created a kind of place he thought was him. So he must love the house because he still owns it and lives there at certain times of the year. So I hope everybody enjoyed the video. If you liked it, if you would give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. It lets me know if I'm on the right track. So I also hope that everybody has been having a good day. And tune in again soon 
for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.